Exercise 9.2. Listen to a lecture in a dance class. Okay, today we're talking a bit about recording choreography. Let me start with a question for you. Do you know what steps dancers use during the first productions of, oh, say, of Swan Lake, or for that matter, any of the most famous ballets? That's really a trick question because, well, in most cases, no one knows, not really. Believe it or not, no written choreography exists for the early performances of most of the world's most famous classical ballets, or for that matter, even for a lot of modern ballet. So, how did choreographers teach dancers how to perform their dances? Mostly, they demonstrated the steps themselves, or they had one of the dancers model the steps for the other dancers. Sure, systems of written choreography have been around for a long while. Some systems use numbers. Some use abstract symbols. Some use letters and words. Oh, and musical notation. Some systems use musical notes. The two most common systems in use are called lab notation and、um, the Banesh system. Banesh movement notation, it's called. But here's the thing: choreographers don't use these systems all that often. Why not? You ask. Well, because of the time it takes. Because, well, because recording three-dimensional dance movements, it's very difficult, very complex, and especially it's very time-consuming. A single minute of dance can take up to maybe, well, maybe six hours to get down on paper. You can imagine how long recording an entire ballet would take. And choreographers tend to be very busy people, but computer experts came to the choreographers' rescue. Computers have been used since the 60s to record choreography. The first one, well, the first one I know about anyway, was a program written by Michael Knoll, and it was. Oh, I guess by today's standards, you'd say it was pretty primitive. The dancers looked like stick figures in a child's drawing, but、um, uh, since the 1980s, sophisticated programs have been around. Programs that, well,、um, they let choreographers record the dancers' steps and movements quite easily. The only problem with these, the software programs, was that they required very powerful computers to run them. And as you no doubt know, not all dance companies have the kind of money you need to buy a mainframe computer. But because personal computers now have more memory, more power, well, now you can choreograph a whole ballet on a good laptop. Oh, and I meant to mention earlier, we owe a lot of the credit for these improvements in the software for dance choreography to the space program. Back in the 60s and 70s, engineers at NASA needed computerized models. Three-dimensional moving models of astronauts' bodies, so that the engineers could design spacesuits and spacecraft. And it turned out that the models they designed could be adapted quite nicely to dancers' bodies. So anyway, I've reserved the computer lab down the hall for the rest of this class. We're going to spend the rest of our time today playing around with some of this choreography software. Okay? So let's walk over there. Now get ready to answer the question. You may use your notes to help you. Question one: What is the main point of this lecture? Listen to a discussion in a psychology class. Excuse me, excuse me, Professor Mitchie, but. I'm a little confused about what you just said. You're confused. Why is that, Deborah? Well, you said that you don't. Well, that most scientists don't think that ESP really exists. Okay, now you're clear what I'm talking about when I say ESP. It's mind reading, that kind of stuff, extrasensory perception. Well, that's a pretty good definition. It's well, it can be telepathy. It's communicating mind to mind. Or telekinesis—that's moving things with your mind. Precognition, which is knowing the future or seeing the future. Other phenomena too. And the study of ESP is sometimes called parapsychology. But you think, well, you think all that is nonsense, I guess, right? Now I'm not saying there aren't people who have 
well, remarkable senses of intuition. But I think that's because they're just very sensitive, very tuned into their environments, to the people around them. I don't think they have any abnormal mental powers beyond that, no. Well, I was just reading an article about ESP, and it said that there were scientific experiments done at some university. I don't remember where. But the experiments were done with the cards, and that they proved that some people could read minds. She's probably thinking of those experiments at Duke University. Right. It was at Duke. Well, yes, there were a series of experiments at Duke about 70 years ago. Professor J.P. Rhine, who was, interestingly enough, a botanist, not a psychologist, he founded the Department of Parapsychology at Duke, and he and his wife did a lot of experiments, especially involving telepathy. He used those cards, didn't he? The ones with, like, stars and crosses? Yes, well, at first he used ordinary playing cards, but then he started using a deck of 25 cards. There were five symbols on these cards, a star, a cross, some wavy lines, a circle, and um, maybe a square. So how do the experiments work? Well, basically it went like this. One person turned over the card and looked at it carefully, really trying to focus on it, to, to picture it in his mind. This person was called the sender. The other person, called the precipient, had to guess what symbol the sender was looking at. So, if it was just a matter of chance guessing, how many times should the precipient guess correctly? Five, I guess. I mean, since there are five types of symbols and... And 25 cards, yes, that's right. The law of averages says that you should get 20% right, even if you have absolutely no ESP talent. So if someone, and they tested thousands of people at their lab, if someone on average got more than 20%, they'd get tested more. And some of these individuals went on to get remarkably high scores. So, huh, well, doesn't this prove that some people can, that they have powers? Well, after Ryan did his experiments at Duke, a lot of similar experiments have been done at Stanford University, in Scotland, and elsewhere. And the conclusion, most researchers have decided that Ryan's results were, I guess the kindest word I could use is questionable. More recent experiments have been done under more carefully controlled conditions. And those uh, remarkable results, those really high scores that Ryan got, have been rare, practically non-existent. And in science, the trend should be the opposite. What do you mean, Professor? Well, you know, if the phenomenon you're studying is real, and the experiments are improved, are more reliable, then the results you get should be more certain, not less certain. So that's why you don't believe in ESP? To put it in a nutshell, I've just never seen any experimental proof for ESP that stood up to careful examination. Now get ready to answer the question. You may use your notes to help you. Question 2. What are the speakers mainly discussing? Listen to a lecture in an archaeology class. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Robert Wolf, and I'm president, well, I should say past president of the State Archaeological Society. I'd like to thank Professor Kingsley for asking me to, to come in and talk to you all about a subject I'm pretty passionate about, shipwrecks. You see, I'm also a diver, and I'm a member of the International Underwater Archaeology Society, and I've been on a lot of underwater expeditions to investigate shipwrecks. A lot of times, when someone mentions shipwrecks, you think of pirates and treasures buried under the sea. And in reality, many divers the ones we call treasure hunters, do try to find shipwrecks with valuables still aboard them. In fact, that's one of the problems we face in this field. Some shipwrecks have literally been torn apart by treasure hunters searching for gold coins or jewelry, even if there wasn't any there, and underwater archaeologists weren't able to get much information from these ships. But shipwrecks are, they can be a lot more than just places to look for treasure. A shipwreck is a time capsule, if you know what I mean. A photograph, a snapshot of what life was like at the moment the ship sank. And unlike sites on land, a shipwreck, it's, 
uncontaminated. It's not disturbed by the generations of people who live on the site later. Unless, of course, treasure hunters or someone like that has gotten there first. And so they're valuable tools for archaeologists, for historians. For example, the world's oldest known shipwreck. It sank in about mm, 1400 BC off the coast of Turkey. The artifacts on that ship completely changed the way we think of Bronze Age civilizations in the Mediterranean. So I'm mostly going to stick to shipwrecks that occurred here that happened off the coast of New England, and I'm going to talk about what we learned from them, what archaeologists have learned from them. There have been plenty of shipwrecks in this area. Over the years, fog and storms and rocks and accidents and sometimes even war have sunk a lot of ships around New England. I'm going to be showing you some slides of shipwrecks from trading ships that sank in colonial days, in the 1600s, to the Andrea Doria, which went down in the 1950s. The Andrea Doria, that's, um, I suppose that's the most famous shipwreck in the area. The Italian ocean liner, the Andrea Doria, and it's a deep, dangerous dive to get to it, I'll tell you. Oh, and after that, we're going to play a little game. I'm going to show you some slides of artifacts that were found on board shipwrecks. Show them just the way they looked when they were found, and you have to guess what they are. Now get ready to answer the question. You may use your notes to help you. Question 3. What does this lecture mainly concern? Listen to a discussion in an economics class. Okay, good morning everyone. I trust everyone had a good weekend and that you managed to read chapter... chapter 7 on taxation. Friday we talked about the difference between progressive and regressive taxes. And today we're going to talk about two other types of taxation, direct and indirect what did the text say about direct taxation? Yes, Troy? Well, the book, according to the chapter that we read, it's, um, that's when the person who's being taxed... Well, it could be a person, or it could be an organization. Right, the person or organization who's being taxed pays the government directly. Is that it? That's great. Now, can you provide an example for us? Yeah, uh, how about income tax? Why would you consider income tax a form of direct taxation? Well, because, um, the person who earns the income pays the taxes directly to the government, right? Yes, good, Troy. Okay, so someone else. What is indirect taxation? Cheryl? Well, if I understand the book correctly... It's when the cost of taxes, of taxation, is paid by someone other than the, uh, the person or organization that is responsible for paying the taxes. I'd say you understood the book perfectly. That's a good definition. Now, Cheryl, we need an example of indirect taxation. Okay, let's see. What if someone, some company, brings, oh, say, perfume into the country from France? And let's say there's an import tax on the perfume that the government collects from the company. And then, well, the importer just turns around and charges customers more money for the perfume to, um, just to pay the import tax. Good example. Anyone think of another one? How about this? Last year, my landlady raised my rent. And when I asked her why, she said it was because the city raised her property taxes. Is that an example? It certainly is. It... Yes, Cheryl. You have a question? Yes, Professor. What about sales taxes, direct or indirect? Good question. I'm going to let you all think about it for just a minute. Talk it over with the person sitting next to you, if you want. And then... then you're going to tell me. Now get ready to answer the question. You may use your notes to help you. Question 4. What is the main purpose of this discussion?
Listen to a discussion in an art class. Hello, everyone. Today I'm going to be showing you some slides of. Well, I'm just going to project a slide on the screen and see if you can tell me who the artist is and what the name of the painting is. This is his most famous painting. Here we go. Anyone know? Yeah, I've seen that painting before. I don't remember the name of the artist, but I think the painting is called Nighthawks at the Diner. Yeah, that's. Well, a lot of people call it that, but the real name of the painting is just Nighthawks. Anyone know the artist? Anyone? No. The painter is Edward Hopper. Now, tell me, what sort of reaction do you have when you see it? It's kind of lonely, kind of depressing, and、uh, bleak. It's so dark outside, and inside there are these bright lights, but but they're kind of harsh. The lights are, and the people in the diner seem. Well, to me, they look really lonely. A lot of Hopper's works show loneliness, isolation. He was a very realistic painter. One of the reasons he was so realistic, maybe, is that he started off as an illustrator, a commercial artist. And you know, of course, a commercial artist has to be able to paint and draw realistically. In fact, Hopper spent most of his early career doing illustrations and just traveling around. He didn't develop his characteristic style, his mature style, until I'd say not until he was in his forties or maybe fifties. Anyway, most of his paintings show empty city streets, country roads, railroad tracks. There are paintings of storefronts, restaurants, and let me show you another. This is the first one of his mature paintings, and the first one that really made him famous. It's called. The house by the railroad. It's pretty bleak too, isn't it? You'll notice as we look at more slides that,、uh, well, there aren't many people in the paintings, and the ones that you do see, they look, you could almost say, impersonal, melancholy. That's the mood he tried to convey. Wait, let me back up just a second. He, Hopper, always said he was just painting what he saw. That he wasn't trying to show isolation and loneliness, but one look at his paintings tells you he wasn't being completely honest about this. Some of these paintings remind me of, of those old black and white movies from like the 30s and 40s. Yeah, I agree. That type of movie, that style of movie making, is called film noir, and yeah, it does have that same feel, doesn't it? And it's interesting that you should say that. Because Hopper did have an influence on some movie makers, on the other hand, he did not have much of an influence on his own generation of painters. Nobody else painted the way Hopper did, at least not until, well, until the photorealistic painters in the '60s and '70s. But his contemporaries weren't interested in realism. They were, well, we'll see some of their works next week when we talk about abstract expressionism. Now get ready to answer the question. You may use your notes to help you. Question five: What is the main topic of this discussion? Listen to a discussion in an advertising class. Morning class. In our last class, we were talking about regulation, about regulation in the advertising industry. In fact, you may remember I said that in the United States, in some European countries too, advertising is one of the most heavily regulated industries there is. What did, um, what example did I give of regulation, government regulation of advertising? Well, you you gave the example of. That the United States banned cigarette advertising back in the 1960s, the early 1970s, actually. That's right. Up until then, tobacco companies and their advertising agencies would portray smoking as part of this, oh, this carefree, this oh so glamorous lifestyle. And then it came out in these scientific studies done by the government that tobacco smoking was really dangerous, really unsafe, and so. 
No more tobacco advertisements. At least not on television or radio. You could still advertise in magazines, on billboards, and so on for a long time after that. Don't ask me why, but you could. And some studies show that the studies seem to indicate that the advertising ban. Oh, and I might mention there was also negative advertising by the government and anti smoking groups telling people not to smoke. Anyway, these studies show that smoking, that the use of tobacco actually went down. Okay, there were also some examples in the article I asked you to read for today. Other examples of government regulation? There was the example from Sweden about how Sweden completely banned advertisements for children. Right, for children under 12. That happened back in 1991. Now, not to get too far off track here, but since that article was written, there was a European Court of Justice ruling, and it said that Sweden still has to accept. That it has no control over advertisements that target Swedish children, advertisements that come from neighboring countries or from satellite. So, this undercuts to a certain extent what the Swedes were trying to do. But still, you can see their intent to, to protect their children from、uh, the effects of advertising. Don't you think that law was a little extreme, maybe? In my opinion, as a matter of fact, yes, yes, I do. Personally, I think advertisements meant for children should be controlled, maybe controlled more carefully than at present, but not necessarily eliminated. And I, speaking for myself still, I think they should be controlled by a combination of government regulation and self regulation. And that's what we're going to be talking about today. Sometimes self regulation works well enough, but But if the idea of self regulation is to create nothing but honest advertisements, advertisements that are in good taste, well, you only have to turn on your TV and you'll see that this system of self regulation has its faults, right? Now get ready to answer the question. You may use your notes to help you. Question 6 What is the class mainly discussing? Listen to a lecture in a world literature class. So, for the rest of the class today, we're going to talk about the two most important poems, epic poems, in Greek literature. And really, not just in Greek literature, but in any literature anywhere in the world. These are the Iliad and the Odyssey, written by the blind Greek poet Homer. At least we think he was blind. Now, if you happen to have a copy of the syllabus that I gave you last week, you'll notice that we're not going to be able to. We just don't have time to read all of these two poems and talk about them. An epic poem, I probably don't have to tell you this, is a narrative poem, a really long narrative poem. So we're going to read a few passages from the Iliad, and we'll read a bit more from the Odyssey. What I want to talk about today are some of the. The ways these two long poems, especially their main characters, how they're different. Some people have said that the Iliad is the world's greatest war story, and the Odyssey that it's the world's greatest travel story. The Iliad tells about the Trojan War, the war between Troy and the various Greek kingdoms. The Odyssey tells about a Greek warrior's trip home and all the amazing adventures he has on the way. And he has some wild ones, too. The warrior's name is Odysseus, hence the name for the poem. I think the reason that I prefer the Odyssey to the Iliad myself is that, well, I guess you could say I just like the main character of the Odyssey better than the main characters of the Iliad. As I said, the Iliad is the story of the Trojan War and about the clash, the personality conflict between the main characters. The conflict isn't just between warriors from either side. A lot of the story deals with an argument between the two strongest Greek warriors, Achilles and Agamemnon. Anyway, the main characters in the Iliad, they're strong, they're great warriors, but you know, they're not as clever, not as smart as Odysseus. He's the one who thinks up the plan to end the war after ten long years and defeat the Trojans. He's the The mastermind behind the scheme to build the Trojan horse. You probably know something about that already. The Trojan horse has been in lots of movies and so on. 
Anyway, he helps end the Ten-Year War, and then he sets off for home and his family. It takes him another ten years to get home, where his wife has been waiting faithfully for him for twenty years. But, but like I said, he has plenty of adventures on the way. Oh, and the other thing about Odysseus that I like is that, well, the characters in the Iliad are pretty static. You know what I mean? They are, they don't change much. This is true of most of Homer's characters, in fact, but it's not true of Odysseus. During the course of the epic, on account of the long war and all the the bizarre experiences he has on the way home, he changes. He evolves as a character, just like characters in most modern novels do. Okay then, before we go on, does anyone have any comments, comments or questions? Now get ready to answer the question. You may use your notes to help you. Question 7. What is the main point of this lecture? Listen to a lecture in a modern history class. All right, then. I want to talk about the founding of the United Nations, but before I do, I want to just mention the League of Nations, which was the predecessor of the United Nations. Last week we talked about the end of the First World War. It ended in 1918, if you remember. Well, right after the war, several leaders of the countries that had won the war, including Wilson of the United States and Lloyd George of Britain, Clemenceau of France, Oh, and Jan Smuts of South Africa. And, well, there were others, too. They recognized the need for an international organization, an organization to keep the peace. So when the agreement that ended the war, the Treaty of Versailles, it was called, was signed, it included a provision that, that included formation of the League of Nations. Its headquarters were in Geneva, Switzerland. But the problem with the League from the beginning was that some of the most powerful nations of the time never joined. As I said, the, uh, the main drive, the main impetus for forming the League came from Woodrow Wilson, President of the United States. But during the 1920s, the United States went through a period of isolationism. In other words, it just basically withdrew from international affairs. Wilson worked and worked to get the U.S. Senate to agree to join the League, but he never could. Other powerful nations joined, but then quit or were kicked out. This included Brazil, Japan, Germany, the Soviet Union. The other problem was uh, the League of Nations never had any power, really no power to enforce its decisions. It had no armed forces. It could only apply economic sanctions, boycotts, and these were pretty easy to get around. The League of Nations did have a few successes early on. It helped prevent wars between Bulgaria and Greece, Iraq and Turkey, and Poland and Lithuania in the 1920s. And the League also had some success in refugee work and famine relief and so on. Oh, and it brokered some deals, some treaties, to get countries to reduce the size of their navies. But the League was completely, totally powerless to stop the build-up to the Second World War in the 1930s. So, uh, during the war, during World War II, I mean, the League didn't meet. Then after the war, it was replaced by the United Nations, which, of course, was headquartered in New York City. Still, the League of Nations was, uh, well, I think it served an important role. It developed a new model of internationalism. In the late 19th and early 20th century, internationalism really just meant alliances of powerful nations— and these alliances often dragged other countries into conflict. That's what happened, really. That's what led to World War I. But the League was at least an attempt to bring all the nations of the world together to work for peace. 
True, it didn't work, not really. But at least there was an effort made. Oh, and another thing I meant to add, the structure of the League of Nations, the, uh, the administrative structure, the government, if you will, was very similar to that of the United Nations. The Secretary General, the Secretariat, the General Assembly, the Security Council, these are all fixtures of the United Nations that came from the League of Nations. Okay, we're going to have to wait until next class to discuss the United Nations, but I just wanted you to be aware of the League of Nations because of its role, its uh, place in history, which I think has often been misunderstood. Now get ready to answer the question. You may use your notes to help you. Question 8. What is the main subject of this lecture? Listen to a lecture in an environmental studies class. Let's go ahead and get started. I'd like to finish up our discussion of alternative energy sources this week. Remember our definition of an alternative energy source? It has to be environmentally friendly, non-polluting in other words. And what else? Renewable. Not like oil or coal. When you use those, bang, they're gone, they're used up. Renewable sources keep replacing themselves. Okay, so we discussed solar power and wind power one day, and tidal energy, energy from the waves, hydroelectric power from waterfalls, we discussed that too. And in our last class, we talked about one kind of geothermal energy, hydrothermal energy. That's the energy that comes from hot water, from hot springs under the earth. In places like, oh, say, Iceland, parts of New Zealand, where you have these uh, features, this can be a very good source of heat and power. But unfortunately, hot springs aren't found all over the world. Okay, well, there is another source of geothermal power called hot dry rock. That's hot dry rock or HDR. Ever heard of it? No? Eh? Well, the chances are you'll hear a lot about it before long. How does HDR energy work? Well, in theory anyway, and let me stress I say in theory, it's pretty simple. You use oil well drilling equipment, big drills, and you punch two holes down into the earth about, oh, maybe two miles, five kilometers maybe. That's about as far as you can drill into the earth for now at least. Down there, deep in the earth, there is this extremely hot cauldron of rock, of granite. So then you pump water from the surface into the first tube. The water goes down to the hot rock and becomes superheated. Then, the superheated water rises up the second tube. Oh, I forgot to mention that these two tubes are interconnected. This hot water rises up the other tube, and you use that to heat up a volatile liquid. Do I need to go into what I mean by that? No. Okay. So then, this volatile liquid turns into a vapor, a gas, and you use it to turn an electrical turbine and... Bingo, you have electricity. And then, when the water has cooled down, you just send it down the first tube again so that you don't waste water. So, does HDR technology meet our criteria for alternative energy? Let's see. Is it environmentally friendly? You bet. There are no toxic gases, no greenhouse emissions, no nuclear wastes. Is it renewable? Sure it is because the earth automatically replaces the heat that is used. Here's another possibility. If you built a big HDR facility by the seacoast, you could pump seawater down one tube. The seawater is heated way past boiling, so you could separate water vapor from the salt and other minerals in the seawater. After you used the hot water vapor to generate electricity, you'd have pure fresh water for thirsty cities nearby, and as a side effect, you have the salt. Now, will this work everywhere? No, conditions have to be just right. 
You have to have really, really hot granite masses no more than about five kilometers below the earth. We know there are places like this in Australia, in the southwestern United States, in France, a few other places. There are probably a lot of other sites, too, that we are not aware of. In fact, there may be a lot of HDR sites, and who knows how important a source of power this may turn out to be. Right now, engineers are building a small prototype HDR station in southern Australia and one in New Mexico. These could be up and running in a decade or less. Of course, getting started would be expensive. Drilling a hole that far into the ground, building generators, all of that will cost lots of money. But, you know, the way oil prices keep going up, HDR energy production could become more and more financially attractive. Okay, I'm going to hand out a diagram of what one of these uh, prototype HDR facilities looks like, the one in Australia. And then once you've had a chance to take a look at it, we'll talk some more about it. Now get ready to answer the question. You may use your notes to help you. Question 9. What is the main idea of this lecture? 